um, graduate um, accommodation last night on the way to the restaurant. So that tells you where he went to graduate school anyway. And I think he was actually a student of Larry's, believe it or not. So yet another connection. Um, I have a connection to Sean as well because he was on the SAB of a company called Structural Genomics, which I started. So it's a pleasure to introduce you. And he's going to take us on a walk around the human genome, which I think is a very good thing to do before lunch. Thank you. Oh, and but, yeah, good. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Tim. So if you ask somebody to draw the human genome, they might draw something on your blackboard that looks like this Cy Twombly painting. Uh, it's three billion bases long. Uh, it's packaged somehow that we don't understand very well. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of an opaque mess. And a statistic that they would tend to quote to you that's one of the most famous statistics about the human genome is that only about 1% of it codes for protein. And so if that's the statistic you know, and this is the sort of resolution that you're looking at the genome at, you might say, well, what's the other 99% do? And you're probably aware that there's an argument that's been going on in the community about junk DNA and noisy transcription and things like this, where the story will usually go that scientists dismissed all this other DNA because they didn't know what it was doing and they called it junk. What I want to do today is sort of take you deeper into the human genome and try to convince you that actually molecular biology is not that stupid. We're pretty stupid, but not that stupid. And we know actually a fair amount about how genes are turned on and turned off by regulatory sequences that are non-coding sequences. And we know a very important thing about the bulk of the composition of mammalian genomes that I'll tell you. And we know something about the noise levels that we expect from transcription. And I think by sort of going through a sort of power of 10 thing, zooming in on a particular piece of genome, um, it'll give you some perspective that I think is useful. But I want to sort of set the stage first. Being at this meeting, thank you for inviting me to this meeting, has reminded me to think about, I don't know, where our curiosity comes from, where my curiosity comes from, how I got into this, and why this is my calling. When I was a kid, I got to play with model rockets and chemistry sets and dissect fish. And, and I, had a, I had a microscope for my grandfather. And I could look at onion cells, which are spectacular, actually, with very little stuff, with a cheapo microscope. You can see mitosis in plant cells. So these are chromosomes, right? This is an interface nucleus that's been stained, so you see the DNA. And these are, of course, chromosomes in mitosis. And the spectacular thing about something like a, a bean cell or an onion cell is that the chromosomes are enormous. There's a lot of DNA in these cells. It's about you know, 10 or 100 times more than what's in our cells, which is what makes it so visible to a, a cheapo microscope. I was fascinated by this kind of stuff. And I was fascinated by my high school genetics. And of course, the people who saw this in the first place back around the turn of the century, they were also fascinated by this because the binary nature of mitosis was giving you a big clue that the sort of digital nature of heredity might be somehow connected to this binary business of, of mitosis, which of course it is connected. With a better microscope and better techniques, we can see human chromosomes at fairly good resolution. This is a karyotype, the sort of laid out, beautifully arranged chromosomes of a human, uh, stained with something called chromosome painting that's a sort of uh, reasonably modern technique for visualizing the overall structure of the chromosomes. Um, ah. Try to do that without hitting the advanced button. Um, where you can sort of see uh, some of the local structure of chromosomes. And if there was a big re rearrangement, if this was a cancer cell that had been karyotyped, or if there was something uh, wrong with the chromosomes of this person, or if they had an extra chromosome 21, you would see that, that kind of information from this low resolution color. If the color was a little higher resolution, um, and if this was my older daughter's karyotype, you would see about a 1 million base inversion on chromosome 9. It's completely harmless and runs in the population at about a 1% level. And if you could sequence this genome, which of course we can now, and you zoomed completely into a single base on chromosome 7, and it was my genome, you'd see a single base deletion in the CFTR gene for cystic fibrosis, fortunately, on only one of my two chromosomes. And that's, of course, the kind of information that we get from karyotypes, from 23andMe arrays, and now from whole genome sequencing. And we'd like to know how to interpret. It's going to be super important for clinical work. But for people like me, it's also important for basic work as we try to understand how genomes work. These are my chromosomes, two of them, um, at very low resolution from what was clinical standard at the time. 
trying to give you here a sense of the scale of what we're talking about. And this is, these are sort of numbers that are around. You might be familiar with them. The actual length of chromosome one sort of unfolded like that. Sorry, that's a very sensitive button. Um, it's about eight microns. So it almost spans a nucleus, really. Um, but packed into that chromosome is, of course, an awful lot of DNA. It's a single molecule. It's super thin. It's just a base pair wide, um, ultimately. And it would unpack to about three inches of DNA. The whole chromosome laid end to end would be something like three feet or so. So it's an amazing compaction. And this is sort of depicted here, where there's various stages of the, of the compaction that we're still trying to understand. The special thing for me, and the kind of work that we do computationally in genome analysis, is of course that this is digital information, A, C, G, and T. And that fact had been worked out gradually over time. It's probably most famous, famously known because of the double helix structure of DNA worked out by Watson and Crick and Rosalind Franklin and others in 1953 in a paper in Nature. Um, the, double hel ah, the double helix is iconic. The, one of the first drawings is Francis Crick's. He didn't consider himself to be a very good artist, but I quite like it. Um, his, one of his first drawings of the double helix. And then the drawing by Odile Crick, his wife, that actually showed up in the Nature paper in 53. A, C, G, and T, they base pair. We get a sequence of this DNA. And the idea that that sequence of DNA might sort of encode the information for biology actually goes way, way back, before the double helix, before genetics, and can be found, for example, in a letter from Friedrich Miescher, the guy who discovered DNA as a sort of chemical thing he could purify, wrote a set of letters to his uncle that were preserved. In one of those letters, he was saying, well, you know, I've been reading about this stuff from Mendel about heredity, and there's all this complexity, and there's this underlying binary stuff that seems to be going on with some kind of gene, genes, the name came later. He said, maybe what's going on is there's an underlying alphabet, sort of a polymer code, that just like a language is expressed by a, a, an underlying alphabet, all the complexity of biology is coming from an underlying set of letters. Now, ironically, he used as, as examples in his letter proteins. People thought that proteins were the, the, the stuff of heredity at the time, even though he was the guy who discovered DNA. But because it's digital information and we can get these sequences, we can take a purely statistical attack on trying to figure out what's important in these sequences. So even though we don't know the language, and the language is going to be super complicated. It's not going to be a human language. It's a biochemical language. It's analog language of proteins and functional RNAs at the end of it. Um, but some of the stuff that we can apply are techniques that come from digital signal processing or cryptography or other kinds of statistical analysis. And I want to do a little digression here on one of the most famous and I think coolest examples of someone cracking a language where the language was completely unknown. So a script called Linear B that was found in stone tablets in Crete, um, dating to about 1500 to 1200 BC. All you had were these stone tablets. The language was completely lost. And there was a cottage industry of people trying to crack this language and figure out what it might be. And people sort of arguing over their solution versus someone else's solution. An amateur mathematician, Michael Ventris, working with his sort of Watson-like buddy, John Chadwick, um, cracked this by statistical attack, by finding common patterns that were recurred. And by a stroke of luck, it turned out that this is just an alternative script for Greek. So you could map the statistics of linear B onto the statistics for Greek, recognize the commonality, and say, these have a common origin. That's not so different from what we do with DNA analysis. A part of this story that I like and why I want to make this little digression about it is the parallels to the discovery of DNA, the DNA double helix are spooky. Both of these happened in 1953. They involve a Sherlock Holmes-like character working with a buddy. The buddy goes off and writes a book, and I recommend to you highly the book, The Decipherment of Linear B, just as much as I would recommend Watson's book, The Double Helix, to you. They are just as exciting to read. And hidden behind this story, and relevant to one of the talks we heard this morning, is a woman who has forgotten the time. When I gave this talk as a practice talk, I actually cried at this point, and I'll try not to. There is a beautiful, beautiful obituary written in the New York Times in 2013 about Alice Colbert, who was a classicist working sort of at her kitchen table with the data from these um, tablets, collating it into little card files in these cig cig cigar boxes and cigarette boxes. The primary data 
for this cracking by Ventris was collected by Alice Kober. And she was quite close to the solution herself when she died in 1950. Ventress and Kober, like Watson and Crick with Franklin, did not get along. And she was not given much credit for the cracking of Linear B, which is famous in these circles. Sixty years after her death, the New York Times obituary columnist wrote a belated apology and obituary documenting what Kober had actually done, and there's now a book about it. It's a wonderful book, and it's a wonderful obituary. Anyway, DNA. The size of genomes is, is actually relatively small. I mean, it would be hard to look at, it would be hard to read. But if I was looking at the flu virus, I'd be looking at 14,000 bases, 14 kilobases. It would be the size of a Microsoft Word document. If I was looking at E. coli, I'd be looking at something that's basically the size of a, I don't know, a song on a, on a, on a CD. And the size of the fruit fly genome at 160 million bases might be the size of you know, an album. The human and the mouse genome and other mammalian genomes are three billion bases. They fit on a DVD. They're the size of a movie. This is the DVD of the sequence of the human genome from Solera. I was involved in the um, so-called race between the public project that I was affiliated with and the, and the Solera project. And so now I have this as a coffee coaster in <laughs> sort of the way that the Vikings used to have skulls of their enemies. As, But there are larger genomes, and this is part of the puzzle over junk DNA and non-coding DNA. The onion, the lowly onion, 17 billion bases. The lungfish, 130 billion bases. Uh, the, uh, some plants go up even larger than that, to 600 billion bases or so of, of DNA. What's all that DNA doing? Um, we don't like to think that onions are more complicated than us. We don't like to think that <laughs> lungfish are more complicated than us. So there's a little bit of a paradox, and it was called the C-value paradox back in the day, that DNA content didn't seem to scale with the complexity of the organism, and in fact would vary quite a bit between especially different plant species. All right, so what is going on in this DNA? And now what we're going to do is start this business of a power of 10 scaling in. I'm going to show you snapshots that are going to be a little hard to read that are actually from the UC Santa Cruz genome browser. So back to chemistry sets that are probably illegal now and model rockets that are probably illegal now. The internet is not yet illegal. And you can go to genome.ucsc.edu, or your kids can, and you can see these same plots. The whole genome of the human, of the mouse, of the fly is freely accessible to high school projects or to whatever you want to do. It's a sort of low tech kind of thing, but there's a lot of data behind it. And what you're looking at here is chromosome uh, chromosome 11. It's about 135 million bases. This is a sketch of, darn it. it this is a sketch of the uh, overall structure of the chromosome. We're already zoomed in to about 7 million bases. We've already sort of zoomed in by a couple of orders of magnitude. And what you can see at this scale is just there's a bunch of genes. These things are all annotated genes. They're actually overly annotated because they're coming in different isoforms. So for each one, there's sort of, and you can sort of see just even at low res here, the, the pattern of things. Overall, we think there's about 20,000 protein coding genes in the human genome. It might be 30,000. It's actually hard to tell. Uh, that means that there's one about every 100,000 or 150,000 bases. Okay. Where I'm going to go is I'm going to zoom in on the human beta globin gene, HBB1. This is one of the two genes, there's alpha and beta globin, that go together two and two copies into a little tetramer that makes this structure, hemoglobin, that binds oxygen. This is what's in your blood. Okay. Zoom in tenfold. Now, again, we're looking at the, zoom, the genome browser. I'm only looking at where the genes are. I'll, I'll call up some other tracks as we get closer. But now what we can sort of see, if you squint, is now we're starting to see individual genes, and these genes all start with the same thing. So you don't have to know anything about genes to say, well, they must, they must have something in common. OR, 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 OR. A whole bunch of these genes called ORs. These are olfactory receptor genes. And there's an important lesson in this, in the way that biology and the way that evolution works. So in our neurons that are you know, for smell, we can smell lots of different things. But the basic machinery of how the neurons work is in common. So it's modular. 
So what the neuron does is it expresses one and only one olfactory receptor gene per olfactory receptor neuron. We don't know how that switching is done, actually. It's one of the big mysteries of neuroscience. So you can make one of these things, and it's sensitive to a particular kind of odor, actually several different odors, and then another ORN makes another receptor. And the number of receptors sort of scales with how complex you are about what you, know, what you can smell. And so as we look at different mammalian genomes, what we'll see is something like, well, humans have about 300 or 400 of these. Dogs have about 800. And anybody who's watched the Pixar movie Ratatouille might guess that rats have 1,200 and are very, very sensitive to different kinds of smells. Humans, in fact, not only have 300 active ORs, but they have several hundred inactive ORs that have died relatively recent in evolution, as if smell used to be more important to us in evolution than it is now. And you could sort of see at that scale now, I guess one thing I want to explain is that the protein coding regions are showing up as these little blue tick marks. They're pretty thin on the ground. Sometimes genes will have more coding, sometimes they'll have less. The ORs are actually relatively small genes, so you just get this little tick. And it gives you a sense of the density of coding versus non-coding white space in the genome at this scale. And if you total all that up, you get the famous number. 1% of the genome codes for protein. This is the actual number from the current annotation. People will cite different numbers for this, and that's partly reflecting the fact that there's different annotations that people have used that this number moves back and forth depending on who's annotating the genome. This is the current number. OK, so what's, what's the other 99%? Let's zoom in again. So an important lesson, so there's going to be like three important lessons here. One important lesson is I've turned on another track. What we can do is sequence a bunch of vertebrate genomes. In this case, 100 vertebrate genomes have been lined up. And the track I want you to focus on now at the scale of about 100,000 bases is this little heartbeat, which I hope you can see. So flatline, heartbeat, flatline, heartbeat, flatline, heartbeat. And what, what that is ref reflecting is the fact that we can line up 100 vertebrates, and it turns out that they all have essentially the same DNA. We can align them. We can recognize that it's the same stuff. But it's evolving. It's, it's accumulating changes over evolutionary time. So it's not as if the human has different DNA, like insertions, relative to other mammals. It's the same stuff. It dates back to the common ancestor. We can look at the alignments. We can measure the rate of change of each base, each region of sequence. And evolution consists of mutation followed by selection. If there's no selection, if the DNA is doing nothing for the organism, if it doesn't matter, you make a mutation and it doesn't affect, it doesn't kill you, and it doesn't affect how many kids you have, then all you get is mutation rate. We call that neutral evolution. So nothing is being selected for. The DNA moves at a predictable rate dependent on the mutation rate. Okay? Any amount of selection on that, like you put, the, put in that change, and it's got to be a particular change or you die, or that, really, that base is really important, or some, things like that, slows down the rate that mutations are accepted over time. And we see that as a slower rate. We can measure it by looking at these deep alignments. Okay? That's what this track is showing you. And of course, for the genes that are important, like olfactory receptors and hemoglobin, you get a heartbeat there saying that's conserved, that's conserved, that's conserved, that's conserved. The coding regions are conserved. They're important. You also get a heartbeat on other things. That's the regulatory DNA. And we see the promoters, the enhancers, the switches that are turning genes on and off conserved. And that's one of the reasons we love to see this comparative genome data, because we get from pure statistical analysis a clue of where those little regulatory bits are. But note that most of this is flatlined. Okay? Most of this is not conserved. And I'll just say, before I leave the slide, that you see now hemoglobin B, HBB, and if you look at the gene names around it, HBD, HBF, I think that is, HBG, I guess that's HBE, actually. What you're seeing now is another lesson, like the olfactory receptors, where local duplication of genes lets them specialize for, for functions. They're all globins. They bind oxygen. But a baby has a problem that it's got to get oxygen in different ways than the adults getting oxygen. We're getting oxygen from our lungs. The globin is specialized for picking up that oxygen from your lungs. The baby, the fetus, has to be specialized for stealing oxygen from the mother. And so it, it duplicates and specializes. And we have special hemoglobins that are used by the embryo and by the fetus that have different oxygen affinities as part of that biology. OK, but back to conservation. A really important lesson now from the deep alignments that we can see is that 1% conserved coding. Basically, all the coding sequences conserved. And about 9% that's conserved non-coding. 
threshold dependent. People argue about this, but it's something like 8, eight to 10% is conserved non-coding. That was a little surprising when we started, started getting that number. It was not surprising that, was that there was conserved non-coding sequence because we knew that there's regulatory stuff. We've known since the birth of molecular biology from Jacob and Minot studying bacteriophage genes turning on and off that the non-coding sequence was used as a regulatory switch, promoters and enhancers and other things. We were a little surprised that it was so much, but that was okay because it meant there was lots, lots to study. The 90% was completely consistent with earlier stuff that it, from the population geneticists saying most of the human genome can't be functioning for much that's important because there's just too much of it. If all of it was important, we'd be dead from mutations given the mutation rate and what have you. So this fit into a model that had been called by Susumo Ono, a population geneticist, junk DNA, that most of the genome was not doing something for us. Okay? It's not under selective pressure. Now, he called it junk. And he's actually written that he wrote this because he believed that you should take sort of a lawyerly approach of, of, of using very strong words to incite debate. And God knows this word has incited debate. <laughs> because people hear junk and they say, my genome doesn't have junk in it, or God doesn't make any junk, or evolution would not tolerate any junk in the genome, it would be selected out. Okay? And so it's really important to understand what's going on here. So now let's zoom in again, because now we get to see a piece of the answer. So now we're zoomed into about 7,000 bases. Here's hemoglobin B. Now we see this gene resolve out a little, that we can see a little bit more, and I'll talk more about this. The gene is bigger than its coding region. The, the thin line, there's two of them, are introns. They're bits that are going to be made into RNA, but they're going to be spliced out and thrown away before you make the spliced mRNA. The spliced mRNA is going to have these sort of medium boxes and big boxes. The big boxes are the coding region. The middle boxes are untranslated regions at the, at the start and stop of the, of the mRNA. So we're going to, very important, the gene is much bigger than its coding region. The amount that's transcribed, much bigger than its coding region. Now, look at the stuff over to the left. This was flatlined white space over here. It's annotated. I've turned on one of the other tracks. This is actually annotation coming off software developed in my lab in collaboration with some of the other people working in human genomics. L1, ALU, L1, ALU, L1. These are repetitive elements. These are mobile elements. They're related to viruses. Our genome is full of them. L1 and ALU are just names for particular kinds of these means that are filling up our genome. They have their own little life as molecular parasites. They replicate. They're alive. They land somewhere. Sometimes they hurt us. Sometimes they don't. They pile on top of each other. They're fascinating to study. They're little viruses that live in genomes. Every genome is full of them. The big, diff the big swings we see in genome sizes are basically measures of how infested the genome is with these little molecular parasites. We're moderately uh, infested as organisms go. Okay? We can see these things they, computationally. When they go in, they tend to die. They will land as a live copy, but then they will accumulate mutations. And once they have accumulated mutations to the point that they can no longer hop somewhere else, they just become a sort of shipwreck that decays away in place. We can recognize them for about 100 million years. That's about how fast the neutral rate goes. And after 100 million years, we can't recognize them anymore. So what we see are, here are the bones. These are actually dead elements. We can see the bones of these dead elements that went in at some point in mammalian evolution. And when we look genome-wide, what we see is that about 50% of the genome is recognizably composed of mobile elements. Because we can only see them to about 100 million years back, we think that a big bulk of this is probably just even older elements that we can no longer recognize. If you don't like to think of your genome being full of junk DNA or full of little parasites, you know, uh, think of this as sort of the, the forest floor. This is the mechanism that's generating DNA. It's sort of seething with activity. These are live as mobile elements. They're not doing much for us. But this is the material that evolution then works with. This is a bunch of DNA. It's sort of a live DNA. It has regulatory elements in it. And we can see lots of signatures of these elements being occasionally co-opted into things that then our biology has taken advantage of. So they're really important to understand for evolutionary reasons. Now we zoom in again. And now we're in on about 700 bases, I think, yeah. 
And now we're looking at exon one and exon two of HBB, and it's being transcribed from right to left. We see exon one. These are little tiny things now. This is coding, this is one coding region that's gonna be spliced onto that coding region. 92 bases of coding sequence attached to 223 bases of coding sequence and so on. So we have this resolution as we zoom in in this browser. We can see now the heartbeat is sort of resolving. There's part, parts of this protein that are more conserved at the DNA level than other parts, and we can see the little regulatory elements upstream of HBB. And now the intron bit becomes important, and it's overlapped with the mobile element bit in a way that's really important. A way that people will, okay, so you might have heard 1% of the genome is coding, but an international consortium called the ENCODE Project recently showed that 80% of the genome is functional, so there's no jump. What they actually showed, among other things, was that about 62% of the genome is detectably transcribed into RNA, pre-mRNA, that's then spliced and goes on and does its thing. But the number that tends to get lost in the way people present that is we already knew, because of the size of introns, that 40% of the genome is transcribed. Not 1%, 40%, just to make the genes that we know about. So the relevant number is actually, what ENCODE showed was 62% of the genome is transcribed, which is an increase of 40 over 40, which is a great result, that's important. But it mostly comes from our increased sensitivity of modern techniques to detect transcription. There are real functional RNAs that are now being detected because of transcriptomics in here, but most of it is consistent with the sort of regulatory events that generate RNA off of promoters and enhancers and other sort of noisy phenomena of genes turning on and off. And that's an active debate in the field. But the relevant number that you want to keep track of is if someone makes the comparison between 1% coding versus you know, 80% is functional or 60% is transcribed, remember that 40% of the genome is already known to be transcribed because of the known genes. So now we're zoomed in all the way onto one coding exon, 92 bases of DNA. And now at this level, ah, it's not going to work. Uh, we're not going to get the alignment. It's messed up the little thing. Let's see what happens. All right, so those are supposed to be aligned. It wrapped it a little bit. What you can do is start aligning human to chimp, and you see there's one change between human and chimp. You bring in the mouse and the rat, and now there's more changes, and you probably can't quite see. 15 changes to the, to the mouse from the human. You can bring in the horse and the chicken and, the, and, and a fish, and you get more changes. The changes they're not really clock-like. You'll hear people say molecular clock. There's a very rough, a sort of molecular sundial that allows us to, to calibrate how far apart organisms are relative to their common ancestor. And as we do this kind of thing, especially for a gene that's as conserved as the globins, it goes all the way back, bacteria have globins, plants have globins, we can reconstruct pieces of molecular evolution that go all the way back to the last common ancestor. And we can build trees, and we can try to deduce what, what are the, the changes that happen. And this, this particular tree I just built off of 92 bases of DNA that I just showed you from exactly the changes we observed in that first coding region of HPB. And even that, if you did that, if, you're, if, if you know, my 12-year-old did that from the browser and said, I have now done an evolutionary tree of, of things, that's actually pretty right just off 92 bases. It turns out it's not quite right. Um, the fish and the chicken are in the wrong order, but that's just because I used 92 bases, and if I used more bases, I'd get a tree that, that looked better. So the more data I get, the more accurate I, my trees get, and not only do I get the order and sort of do, start deducing how things evolved from each other from common ancestors, but a very interesting thing that people can do now is mathematically reconstruct the probable sequences at these ancestral positions. You can say, well, the ancestor of uh, us and mice, that sequence must have looked like this, we can now synthesize that DNA and say, well, how would that protein behave? And especially in cases where the proteins have specialized into like embryonic globin and adult globin, we can say something like, what did the common ancestor of that do? What was its biochemistry? What, was its, what is, were its oxygen binding uh, things? And that gives us clues about evolution as well. So, one of the lessons I want you to get from this talk is you might hear like genome people saying, woo, we've just sequenced the aardvark, or we've just sequenced you know, the six-toed sloth or something. And you might be thinking, you know, there'll probably someday be a senator who comes up and starts saying to the New York Times, why are they doing this? Um, the reason that we're doing it is this business of if, a few insta if many instances can be co collected, we can compare across. We're, 
maybe not so interested in the sloth. I'm sure there's people who are interested in the sloth. I'm not so interested in the sloth. I'm interested in the human. Or you might even accept that we're interested in Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly. Why are we sequencing 100 other fruit flies instead of melanogaster? The reason is to build up these alignments and to deduce what's important in evolution. And so we're deliberately sweeping through the tree of mammals, deliberately sweeping through the tree of Drosophilus, sequencing everything we can get our hands on. And that is a business that we're right in the middle of. This is a famous tree of all of life from Norm Pace, produced back in 1997. There's a sort of you are here kind of effect on this thing because that's you, that's mushrooms, that's corn. Pretty much everything that we think of as animal and plant biology is sitting there. And there's all this other stuff, not just in bacteria and archaea, but even in the eukaryotes. A tremendous diversity of sequence, giving us a lot of information about evolution. There are about 8,000 sequence genomes. Um, we're sort of losing count of them. It's probably an inaccurate number at this point. Depending on who's counting, there might be 100 million species on the planet. There is every reason, there's a cost-benefit argument, but there's every reason to try to collect over all of those because uh, everything gives us information about the pattern of evolution over, over deep time. It is still amazing to me that we can do that, that we can put all these genomes onto our disks. So you can be, as, as I am, fascinated by the biology of, I don't know, honeybees, fruit flies, uh, ciliates, uh, fugu fish. It's stunning to me that we navigate the disks of our computers like we navigate a phylogenetic tree. We can dive down and and see the source code for all, all these organisms. Now, what I haven't told you sort of anything about in this talk is like what we actually do in our lab, the algorithms, you know, the software we build, the kind of stories we tell. And I don't really want to do that because time and you know, I think this is a more interesting story that I'm telling. But what I do want to do is give you a feel for the kind of analysis, a sort of final slide that gives you a feel for the kind of analysis we do by metaphor and by way of teasing the field, my field, and the kind of stories that it's currently telling about the human genome. This is an alignment, not of sequence, but of words, of a common introduction that appears in, a, in many, many papers about the human genome. Hundreds, thousands of papers use very similar phrases. It's a meme. It's being propagated. It's a, its own little alu element. And by aligning them, you can deduce what the important part of the story is. <laughs> the important part of the story is that scientists, dumb molecular biologists, once dismissed something as junk DNA, but blah, 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 now we know it's 80% functional or something like this. We can also tell from this kind of analysis that that's the important part of the story that's being propagated. The actual number is not relevant. The actual data is not relevant. The number, whether it's bits or a landscape or 90% or 98 or three digits of precision, 98.5 or vast areas, is not relevant to the argument. It's just the story itself that we formally dismissed it and we were stupid and now we know better is the relevant operational part of the story. The adverb of when we dismissed it varies, but we can tell that you need to have some, that needs to be part of a story. What we dismissed varies and is not important to the story. We dismissed the genome, we dismissed transmissible, transposable elements, we dismissed re repetitive sequences, somehow we even dismissed, where is it, microRNAs are in there somewhere, which is sort of an amazing thing. Um, long known coding RNA, dark matter, what have you. That's not relevant to the meme. And it could be junk DNA, it could be junk RNA, it could be transcriptional noise, you get variation there. And this is very similar to the kind of modularity that we see in evolution as we see a conserved bit being glued onto other modules, we can learn something about what evolution is doing. And one of the things that we, and these are all real citations, they're all across either the, the, the New York Times, Scientific American, or Nature, Science, you know, real scientific literature. One of the things we have to be careful about when we do this kind of analysis is you can get a functional element that's conserved in biology. We might, remember, we don't know what the function is. We're sort of deducing it statistically often. And then it'll, it'll be glued onto something else that'll change its meaning. So our friends in the creation evolution, uh, the creation intelligence, uh, intelligent design community uh, like to write about the junk DNA debate. And there's a quote from them, long dismissed as junk, the phrase, quote, long dismissed as junk is a concoction invented by journalists, and then it sort of goes on to make sort of some convoluted argument. This is in evolutionnews.org, which is 
about as fun to read as, uh, I don't know, other things you can find on the web. <laughs> and then one I like that, and unfortunately, my color scheme is not showing up very well, but I'll read another example of a very small change that completely changes the meaning of the, of the sequence. And we see this a lot in biology. You'll have a conserved thing. One change will change something from an antagonist to an agonist. And so it's very difficult to infer function, even though we can get confident inference of evolutionary homology, things being related to each other. An example of this is, it is not true that ge the genome was simply dismissed as useless junk. In a review by Alex Palazzo that showed up in 2014, as Alex, me, other people in the field have started to push back on this meme and say, it has never been true that we dismissed the rest of the human genome, the non-coding genome, as junk. Non-coding DNA is used as regulatory DNA, and we know that. There's issues of scale, how much, exactly how it's functioning. Most of the genome is mobile elements. Ono should have never called it junk. Transposons are super interesting, but they're different. They have their own life, different from us. They affect us. We use them for evolution. That's all super interesting. But you've got to understand mobile elements, non-coding regulatory DNA, and intron exon structure, the fact that we transcribe a lot more uh, DNA than we're actually using as mRNAs to really understand the composition of genomes. And with that, I'll stop, and I'd be happy, happy to take questions. Well, I have to say, Sean, I have to congratulate you on a wonderful walk around the human genome. I, the way you constructed that talk was super, and I would love it that my grandkids could learn their way around the genome. They probably won't be interested, but I hope they are. So, questions? Um, really enjoyed your presentation. I've been interested in the ability to trace back biochemical pathways that were applied 50 million years ago that we have lost um, because there is useful information that we could gain from those today. Specifically, partial oxygen pressure used to be very high. Insects had a different size. Hmm. To trace back those biochemical pathways is hard. There are some remnants today. It could be helped by sequences of fossil insects in resins. I don't know where to what has been done there. But tracing those pathways can be very helpful in understanding how under those conditions we dealt with what is today still a major pressure in aging. Your thoughts? I can only completely agree with that. I think this is all interesting. You bring up, um, I think, two points that really resonate with me. One is the ability to reconstruct things that Evolution has had to change with changing sort of geological and environmental conditions on the Earth, and we know something about geology, and that gives us constraints on what we expect from the evolution. Uh, things like the temperature of the Earth changing over time, things like the oxygen content of the atmosphere changing over time, as you're pointing out. And, and there's stories like this that are starting to develop where, where people were even, I was recently talking to someone at Brandeis who's reconstructing very deep sequences, common ancestors of archaea to eukaryotes to bacteria, and those sequences come out as thermophilic sequences, which sort of fits with some ideas about the hot early Earth. And it's just sort of mind-blowing to think about that. Probably wrong, actually, but it's still interesting to think about. And you're also bringing up the business of trying to get non-extant sequences, uh, getting fossils. And um, Neanderthals have been in the news. Um, there was a bunch of stuff about dinosaur DNA and stuff that turned out to be bad and wrong and not, you know, PCR artifact and stuff like that. But we do have some ability to go out, maybe go back maybe tens of thousands of years in the, in the fossils, and maybe that'll get better, and that's really interesting. I want to follow up with a short question then. The reason for tracing those pathways is that one of the components is, can you calculate how heavily you would have to mutagenize current, let's say, insects that we have today? To, break, to reactivate 40% oxygen livability and select mm -hmm. for what that would mean in size, for instance. And th there's many reasons to do such experiments. Have you thought about such calculations? I haven't thought about that. It seems like that ought to be possible, though. OK, Larry, you have next question. So As he has a privilege, you know. I don't need that. Um, so if you were asked a short question that summarized what you really think, which you sort of said what you really think, and the short question would be, uh, 
there are four million-ish SNPs in the human genome. If you had to pick the number that you think may have been selected mm. over time, mm. I want to I want to guide you to the right answer. Do you do you think the answer? <laughs> So I can name 12, mm -hmm. and I guess I might argue that there are 100, mm -hmm. but I don't want you to say 2 million. What would you say? That was my guidance. Larry, you already got his PhD. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, is, yes. this is bringing back, quite, quite, bringing quite. back terrible memories, actually. <laughs> When I, when I, I, I remember well actually taking my comprehensive exams here and, and, and somebody would ask a question like that and I would say, say what, do you, what do you think about that? And I'd say nothing. And what could you tell us about this? Nothing. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, I think it was Mike Klimkowski asked me, said to me, if you, say, if you give us one more one word answer, you're out of here. And then, so, then somebody asked me a question and I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> actually. Actually, the, I, 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 I did hear from Human Longevity, who've done 25,000 whole genome sequences, that one every eight base pairs is a variant in that 25,000. So that tells you that there's a lot more SNPs than 4 million. But what the functional basis of those SNPs is remains to be determined. They're almost entirely leaked. So that's what I would say. I don't know what the exact number is, but you know, each division of each germ cell is accumulating whatever it is, one or two or 10 uh, base changes. Those are largely neutral changes because most of the DNA is neutrally evolving. Uh, so in the spectrum of SNP frequency, uh, all of that, especially the sort of low frequency guys, have got to be neutral guys. Now he's asked lots of questions. I'm going to try and get somebody who hasn't yet asked a question, actually, because these two gentlemen have already asked a question. The guy there, sorry to be selective, but I think it's important to give everybody a chance. So have enough things been sequenced that we actually have decent conservation numbers for older things like bacteria and plants? And, and if you do, which way does it go? Because I could sort of argue both ways, that the older stuff becomes more efficient or, or that there's a lot more fossils lying around. Yeah, it's actually a complicated question to answer precisely because there's different levels that we look at conservation at. Like, if I need to know something like, is this individual nucleotide being conserved? then I actually need a bunch of species that are within like 100 million years, and I need a lot of them to get that kind of resolution. Or I might be asking something about, like, at the protein level, is this stretch of 20 amino acids highly conserved over time, and what's the rate of evolution of that, for which I can go much, much deeper in time. So for questions that go all the way back to the last common ancestor, those are almost exclusively either ribosome RNA questions, where the ribosome RNA is like very highly conserved, or they're like big chunks of, of protein sequence. So um, I guess another answer to the question is the bacteria are examples where there's just so many bacteria that they're surprisingly underrepresented uh, from our standpoint. People will have thousands of bacterial sequences, but the number of times that I'll have like a clade of hundreds of sequences at the right distances around a particular bacterium of, of interest are actually fairly small at this point. But like, do we know enough about bacteria to say that that one percent number in in vertebrates becomes 0.1 percent or 10 percent? Oh, what, conserve, that, conserve coding. Oh, I should have said that, and I actually pulled out a couple slides slides like that. So bacterial genomes are extremely compact. This is really important, um, and I would say the number is what 90 percent for for E. coli is conserved, and we do see that at that level across like the the gamma proteobacteria that coli sit in. So those with no introns uh, are very packed genomes. Right, right. Conserved DNA, important for the for, for coli. Yeah, Dr. Barker, your question. Sorry, question. tremendous talk. Uh, could we just zoom in for a moment on the introns, which we were just talking about, uh, and the thermodynamic consequences of having so much intronic material? Mm -hmm. uh, what insights have we got to that? So thermodynamic meaning, how much ATP am I burning just to make this exactly. enormous amount of... of so I think that's a really interesting question, and I've been meaning to dive into this a little bit more because I've seen a couple papers come out relatively recently trying to do the balance sheet for where all our ATP is going. My understanding is that RNA and replication are actually a really minor component of how much ATP we're burning. The two big burners for us are the, establishing the ion gradients across our neurons and uh, making protein. 
So every amino acid is three GTPs or whatever it is to, to, to polymerize an amino acid. And we're making a lot of protein per mRNA. So those two things are something like 80 or something percent of the, of the balance sheet. And then you get into met metabolism, actually making stuff. RNA is sort of down in the place where you might start going, I can imagine that evolution doesn't care so much about that, especially, and I think this is one of the main points, especially if there is a counterpressure of these mobile elements that are actively moving themselves in the genome. And it take, we have all kinds of defenses trying to reduce their numbers and prevent their movement. And that's a, that's a, a war going on intragenomically. So there's an active force that's trying to expand the size of introns in intergenic regions. And I think evolution is sort of striking a balance somewhere in there. Well, I think it's now time to go and get some food to regenerate that ATP. But before you do, I have to say a couple of things. One is, when you eat your lunch from your boxes, please don't throw the boxes away. But counter to normal American philosophy, please leave them on the tables because they're going to get composted and they don't want to compost the little packets at the same time. Complicated stuff, I know, but please leave it on the outside. And yeah. be back at 2 o'clock, and please thank our speakers. I don't know. I haven't had my genome sequenced yet. You haven't had that yet? Yeah.